we uh, are starting our second panel of the day or second keynote speaker of the day. Um, fresh, not too long ago from Romania, if I'm not mistaken. So um, we have with us Kai Brand Jacobson uh, talking about a path to peace in the midst of escalating war and militarization. Um, Kai will be sharing a PowerPoint slide with us. Um, and we'll be presenting, so you can look up at the screen um, and follow along as well with that. And online, I think it would also be shared, so you can also do that. Um, I'll be here. I'll also keep an eye on the uh, Q&A um, so that I, if, if those that are online would like to leave uh, questions as well, uh, we will be fielding those the same way, did, way uh, we did before. Um, so let me introduce you <clears throat> briefly to Kai, because... What I did is I went up and I looked at Kai's accomplishments online, and there is no way, uh, even in an hour, that I can do him justice uh, for how much he's accomplished and much, how much he's done. So I'm going to try to keep it short, because all of you do have the, the biography uh, the, online and, and the description. Um, but, you know, he's, from what I could attest, as I saw, as I looked online in our discussion last night, um, it, a person really who is... I would say even before his bio says leading pioneer, I would say passionate, a very passionate, dedicated, leading pioneer, uh, innovator, and practitioner in the field of peace building, prevention uh, of violent conflict, mediation, peace process, and addressing challenges and complex crises in the world today. His knowledge base is extremely large. Um, I'm, I'm pretty sure we're not going to be able to talk about all of it today, but um, you know, for more than 25 years, he's worked across all continents. Um, we talked about several examples as well yesterday, specifically geographically speaking, um, war zones and crisis situations, <clears throat> but also has worked with big organizations like the UN and governments and international agencies and other uh, and local communities. We were talking about just local communities and <clears throat> Uh, and citizens of different countries and youngsters and, mm. and those who are a, a bit older. So all of, uh, all of these levels, I guess, of society. Um, he's a senior trainer of International Peace and Development Training Center, IPDTC, and has provided more than 400 trainings and executive leadership programs for governments, UN missions and agencies and organizations in the field. He has several testimonials. I really, I, I, I would invite you to check his bio online and all his accomplishments. We are extremely... Uh, uh, blessed and, and, and privileged to have you amongst us. So thank you very much for joining us. Thank you as well. Thank you. The floor is yours. Thank you very much and good afternoon, everyone. And what I would start by saying is that I feel extremely privileged to be able to be here with you. And I wanted to start by saying thank you to everyone who's been involved in organizing and working to make this conference happen because it is happening on one of the most important issues in our time at a critical moment in our time. And I face the predicament today that uh, many speakers have where I had one wonderful idea of what I would like to do in my head and then life got in the way. You know that quote, life is what happens while you're making plans. So I did not have time or opportunity to condense it all into the form I wanted. And because of that, we're going to go through a lot but I hope it will be in a way that's okay. And we'll share everything here after. And I'm going to try and go through a lot fairly quickly so that we can have a good conversation together after. Does that sound okay? All right. The presentation is gonna be made up of a few premises and a few different parts. And uh, I also heard Paul's presentation before, and you'll see a lot of lines that, that resonate and follow from his as well. But what I want to start with is a different beginning point. And that is that we live in a period of extraordinary innovation, creativity, and discovery. In fact, we live in a period where we have more human freedom, cultural, social, scientific, technological innovation than we have ever had before as a species. And when we look at how do we address the critical issues and challenges that are facing us, this is actually something incredibly powerful and inspiring to be aware of. So we have more people taking part in school and education, especially more girl children with access to education than we've ever had before in history. Over the last 30 years, we've had incredible advancements in many parts of the world of at least pro forma participation. And as we all know, there are a lot of challenges 
to our democratic systems and processes today. But if you compare it to 50 years ago or 100 years ago, what we have achieved through the engagement and initiative and efforts of people struggling for their rights and engaging for change all over the world is historical and breathtaking. We have innovations in medicine, which are extraordinary. We still spend more on golf in North America than in research into sub-Saharan African diseases altogether. But what my grandmother died of 50 years ago can be cured very quickly today. We are making continual and constant advancements, which before could only even be dreamed of or imagined. There is effective apartheid globally in access to medicines, and that's a critical issue we need to look at, but the fact that we're able to innovate it. Here you see artificial limbs. Think about these 40 years ago, how heavy they were, how painful they were, how few people had access to them. This one was printed in minutes on a 3D printer made out of ultralight material. The picture you saw before is a young girl who was born without a hand and had this placed on for the first time just minutes before pitching the opening of a baseball game and she was able to move her hand. There are so many issues which we are finding solutions to. Here you have a, a plant filled with soil or box filled with soil and a plant in it. Two nodes are put into the soil and it generates electricity to allow someone to be able to read or to have light at night where otherwise they wouldn't. And much more from the discovery and understanding of DNA to this one I love. Do you know what this is? The Large Hadron Collider at CERN. What's incredible here is we had more than 6,000 technicians, mechanics, engineers, scientists working on its creation. It cost billions upon billions of euros. And we didn't even know if it would work. There's a book by the Canadian author and physicist Neil Turek, The Universe Within, and he speaks about how incredibly inspiring this was for him. Our ability to ideate, our ability to think through the possible and to make it happen even when we're uncertain of whether it will work or not. And constant innovation in many different fields. This is now being put into place in China. It's a new transport system that runs above traffic. You can take three to 500 people on one of these at a time, and it also then frees up the traffic. Or BMW's first wheelless car that they have already created in prototype. So there's constant evolutions and innovations in so many different ways, so many different spaces of human activity. But the other side of it, and this is what Paul was speaking to as well, is that we live in a period of extraordinary challenge and systemic crisis. And that's almost a contradiction in terms. But the idea is that crisis today is built into our systems from diseases and epidemics around the world to systemic, organized destruction of our world's life system. It's not climate change. It's not climate deterioration. It is the organized destruction of the environment as a result of our economic, social, and political systems. An incredible waste that grows around the world. Poverty. It isn't actually true that poverty hasn't gotten worse as a result of COVID and also the financial crisis, 2007, 2008, and ongoing. We are, in fact, seeing poverty worsening in many areas, but it's also the incredible inequalities in wealth that we have, where today you have a handful of people. This is the presentation I gave when I first left Ottawa 20 plus years ago, and it was 85 people had the same wealth as 3.5 billion human beings put together. And I don't mean what they controlled in companies. I mean their personal capital, their personal wealth. Then about several years ago, 2016, it was eight men had more wealth than half of the world's population put together. Now, post-COVID, six individuals have the same amount of wealth of 4.7 billion human beings. We have the problem of non-payment of taxes. So it's not that we don't have the wealth in our societies, it's that those who control the wealth, whether companies or private individuals, are no longer paying taxes. So you may have seen a few years ago where the 17 richest people in the United States paid less in tax than I did that year because they're able to squirrel it away. And you have publications like the Panama Papers, the Paradise Papers, where journalists have investigated over years and helped to uncover just a tiny portion of what's happening and how this is being done.
And we have the WikiLeaks, where we had the release of information about what was being done by, in this case, one state, in particular the United States, often engaging in practices which violate not only the country's own laws and constitution, but fuel many of the crises and issues that we're discussing. I don't know if you've seen Bregman's uh, talk at the World Economic Forum a few years ago, where all of these people came together from all around the world to discuss the global crises and challenges we're facing. And he said to them at one point, I don't know what we're doing here. You're talking about how we can solve all these problems, but it's like a firefighter standing in front of a fire and not paying attention to the fact that there's no water in the hose. Because when we don't pay taxes, when we don't collect a reasonable amount of the socially produced wealth and use that to meet our needs as a society, then you have dramatic and significant growing of extremes and poverty and lack of investment in basic infrastructure, education, and many other core needs. And we have the spread of war. And this is something I'll go into in more detail later. This is a town in Syria that is the equivalent size of where I live in Romania. And it has been over 95% destroyed. The urbanization of battlefields over the last 20 years, this is a significant development in the dynamics of war, where more and more of the fighting is taking place inside cities. The significant and continual increase in gender-based violence and rape taking place during war, but also after. And the mass human impact that it is having. Here is a migration center in Libya, which was partially funded by the European Commission and the Italian government in particular. And then it was uncovered, again by investigative journalists, that they were actually engaging in human trafficking and slavery, buying and selling human beings. And the mass, not migration crisis, but crisis in our humanity and ability to address the forced displacement of millions of people worldwide. The rise in extremism and hate-based movements all over the world in many different contexts. And we can look at the rise of hatred and hate-based movements. Another area that's incredibly important to understand is how much many of these movements are actually also reflected in policies in government today. So whether we're looking at in China, in Nigeria, in Poland, in Hungary, you have many countries which are now, for example, making it illegal to do gender education in schools or which are attacking uh, fundamental rights that have been achieved over decades and centuries and especially attacking women's rights in many different parts of the world. And the rise of child and youth participation in war, or this is a picture from the United States where the military goes into schools. It's one of the only two countries in the world that hasn't signed the United Nations Convention on the Rights of a Child, and they recruit in schools. These are 14 and 15 year olds there. These are scouts in the United States. You know the scouts movement? They have a joint program with the Department of Homeland Security where they train scouts in counterterrorism operations. Two, the militarization of policing, where the largest trainer of police in the world today is the company formerly known as Blackwater, and changing in equipment that police are prov provided and changing in the practices, the training, the doctrines. The dropping just recently, a few years ago, in the last years of Trump's regime, of the largest non-nuclear bomb in human history. And how many people even know that it happened? and the targeted assassination and killing of journalists in many countries around the world. These are in the European Union, journalists who were involved in investigating corruption through the Panama Papers and the Paradise Papers. This was a couple that was engaged to be married and they were beaten to death in their apartment shortly before their marriage. One of Europe's most famous journalists who when she turned the key in her car to go to work in the morning, the car blew up. And it turns out that at least to the level of the advisor of the prime minister, you had the highest political engagement in the country in her assassination. Brilliant Brazilian politician and one of my former students in Afghanistan who was killed by the Taliban for speaking up for women's rights and for a better future for her country. And I haven't even begun to cover the scale of the challenges we're facing. The other side of this is how do we address conflicts and critical and challenging issues? And there's that definition that we have from emergency response. Actually, sorry, before going to that, um, there's a book by Rebecca DaCosta, which some of you may know of, 
where, called The Watchman's Rattle, where Rebecca looks at this question of why have all the greatest civilizations throughout history, what were recognized as the greatest civilizations because of their uh, political administration, their social complexity, their culture, their art, their ability to generate wealth, their science and technology. So the Khmer civilization, the Mayan, the British Empire, the French Empire, the Soviet Empire, the American Empire. She asks, why is it that all of these civilizations have collapsed or are in the process of collapsing. And she points out that you can go into any university library or any airport library and you will find an entire industry of publications which are saying it's because of corruption in government, constant wars on the frontiers, uh, the spread of diseases, mismanagement of resources, and many other issues. And what Rebecca points to is that to varying extents, all of these are correct different combinations in different areas. But the genius in her book is when she says that the challenge with focusing always on what led to their collapse is we might forget to ask the other important question. Why didn't they solve it? In every one of these cases, they knew these problems existed for years or decades or centuries before it led to the collapse. Why weren't they able to address it? And she calls her book The Watchman's Rattle, using the story of watchmen in medieval Europe, where they would have the role, if there was a fire or if there was robbery in the village or the town, they would shake their rattle and they would say, there is something happening and we need to engage. And her point, is that that is what is happening today. We're facing crises and challenges, and the question is, how will we handle them? The old definition from emergency response and disaster relief is looking at the issue plus our ability to handle it. So an earthquake, a tsunami, is not a disaster in and of itself. It's a disaster if we haven't built our buildings well. It's a disaster if we have destroyed the mangrove forests, which would provide prevention. So just like in our own personal lives, when we experience different issues, tensions, different challenges, if you have the emotional, the social, the life skills capacity to handle it, it isn't necessarily a problem. But in the absence, it can be a crisis. And then my question is, when you look at the political leadership that we have in our world today, and you look at heads of states in countries around the world, are you filled with the deep sense of knowledge, the confidence that we are bringing the absolute best of our human capacity as a species to solve the challenges and the problems that are facing us. This is a European Union head of state some years ago who waved a mock machine gun at journalists saying, you know what you'll get if you keep asking questions. And our state systems around the world today. Another premise is that we are living in a period of extraordinary participation and engagement where people all around the world are rising up to address the lived experience of crisis and challenges they're facing. And I just have a few pictures here from the Fridays for the Future, one of the largest environmental and youth movements in history, to the movement against femicide in many countries from Spain to Brazil, Colombia, many countries around the world, Nigeria especially, the ongoing and continuing struggles for democracy and human rights in Belarus, which in the context of discussing Russia's invasion of Ukraine, many people are overlooking, but you have an effective dictatorship supported by a government in a neighboring country and crushing down upon people's rights. The military regime that took back power in Myanmar, Burma, after what so many people around the world who had seen the struggles for democracy in Burma had been inspired. And then you had the coming back of the military. 
and brutal wars that have been being fought over the last years. Colombia, people's movements to bring back basic rights and economic opportunities, the ongoing repression that's being faced in Hong Kong, but also the way people are standing up to it. In Palestine and Israel, continuing struggles both to overcome the war and to overcome the repressive system in the occupied territories. There are movements that are taking place and happening all over the world. And I was listening to the first part online and I heard uh, someone that was speaking saying, having been part of different movements throughout history from feminist movements to working on social justice to other issues. And one of the key things we face now is all these movements are growing, but by and large, the peace building field is limited or almost not connected to many of them. There are people that are very actively engaged, but broadly, we're not building the alliances and the connections between these issues and these movements, which would be vital for peace building to be honest and engaging with the actual issues that people face in their communities and countries. Okay, I'm gonna go through this part, but it's quite critical, each of these movements, and we could discuss them in detail, but people who are looking at what is happening and standing up and saying enough. We need to have change. This is in Romania, where we had up to five to six to sometimes 700,000 people in the streets every night for months, struggling against corruption and for better governance in the country. And we are also seeing alternatives in styles of leadership, which are based not upon demonizing the other and us versus them or good versus evil, but actual responsible and collaborative governance, addressing issues, recognizing you may have a different opinion than I, but we need to find solutions that make things better for our community overall, and new generations and new forms of leadership that are coming up. And this part is also important because when you look at the media generally, what we often hear is that youth are not involved, youth are apathetic, youth are not participating. This is not the reality of what is happening in the world today. There is massive and profound youth participation and engagement addressing everywhere from local to global issues. So now a little bit on our global context. Paul was speaking before about 1972 and the first United Nations Global Conference on Environment and Ecology. Well, last year was 2022, and the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute published what I would recommend is one of the single most important publications that we can look at today, called Environment of Peace, Security in a New Era of Risk. And what they looked at is that between 2010 and 2020, the number of state-based armed conflicts in the world roughly doubled to 56, as did the number of people being killed by violent conflict. That is no longer correct. Today, it is 63, just from last year to this year. So the number of armed conflicts in the world has more than doubled. The number of people who are displaced has also more than doubled. People displaced as a result of environmental destruction and catastrophes, war and global systemic inequalities and poverty. And this figure is also no longer correct. 82.4 million in 2020. And according to the United Nations last year, it went up to 111 million, 30 million more in the space of two years. In 2020, the number of operationally deployed nuclear warheads increased for the first time in decades. You can see here a well-known graph overall that looks at the steadily increasing number of armed conflicts in the world. One thing that is often not looked at is this one, which is the number of countries which have two or more wars happening at the same time in the country. And that has been increasing since long before. And whereas in 1980, the average war had been going on for 13 years, Today, the average war in the world has been going on for nearly 20 years. So we're both having more wars starting, but also very large numbers of armed conflict that have been continued without solution for decades. And the number of people in humanitarian need worldwide growing dramatically. This is from one of the other most important publications I would recommend in terms of recent works, the 2023 Emergency Watch List by the International Rescue Committee. And David Miliband, the head of the rescue committee, 
has been giving constant speeches and talks anywhere that he can get people to, to engage and to listen, pointing out that the catastrophes that we're facing today are a result of choice and decisions. They're a result of the systems that we have in place, the paradigms which we operate under and how we are approaching peace and security in our world. He also points out that we have the erosion or the failure of state's capacity and our global system's capacity to address these conflicts. And worryingly, we're seeing the breakdown of guardrails that have prevented escalation or crisis between countries. Pope Francis, just a few years ago, said that while the last century knew the devastation of two deadly world wars, the threat of nuclear war, and a great number of other conflicts, today, sadly, we find ourselves engaged in a horrifying world war, fought piecemeal in many different countries. He said this in 2020, 21, before the beginning of the invasion and the war in Ukraine in its most recent phase. The other thing they point out in this emergency watch list is we need to break the cycle of crisis, not just react and respond and run after it. We need to address impunity in conflicts and in governance, not just accept it as something natural. We could also say in economics. And we need to better manage global risk be aware of it, understand it, see what it will lead to, not just allow it to overwhelm us and lead to the breakdown of states and societies and the escalation of violent conflict. This is a publication done every year by the World Economic Forum, the Global Risk Analysis. And it's very interesting. They engage with security experts, politicians, people in business all over the world, and they ask them, what are the major issues that your society is facing, and what are the major issues that we will face in the future? And they have everything from profound social instability, that was the largest, unemployment or underemployment, fiscal crisis, failure of critical infrastructure, large-scale involuntary migration, many others. But the point that they draw out when they look at this is that the crises that we face in the world today are complex. They're not easy. They're not simple. They're not sitting there waiting to be solved. They're multidimensional and multi-causal. Paul spoke about one of the first pioneering publications truly looking at using systems analysis to understand environmental crises. But too much of what we have taught in universities today is single discipline single area of focus. If I'm trained in security studies, I look at it from a security lens. If I'm engaging in gender studies, I look at it from a gender perspective. Yes, we speak about intersectionality, but in reality, in the tools we equip ourselves to make sense of what is happening, we often have our chosen problem or chosen issue, which we then define it by, instead of trying to truly understand its complexity in different dimensions. And they're dynamic, constantly evolving, constantly changing, interconnected. So the failure of the harvest in Russia in 2010 was a contributing triggering factor to the uprisings that you had across North Africa and the Middle East in 2011 because of the increase in grain prices and basic staples, which placed an increased pressure on people. These challenges and problems we face are interconnected and they're self-reinforcing. There are entire economic systems that are built up around them. There are tens of thousands or millions of lawyers that can be engaged and work with them. These are not things that just say, ah, this isn't working well, we should change it. They're deeply embedded. In the publication by Cipri, they use the opportunity of this work to try and also help educate politicians, policymakers, academics, citizens, journalists about the nature of risks we're facing. They look at compound risks where different risks can interplay together and face or create a challenging situation. They look at emergent risks where two or more different risks can give rise to a new one coming up that we hadn't been aware of before. Systemic risks, risks that are so significant they can impact the very functioning and continuance of a system, of a state, of an economy and existential risk. 
that the risks we face in our world today are of such a scale that they can affect our very ability to live. The war in Ukraine or the war in Europe is one example where the conditions which gave rise to the war were built up over 30 years. It didn't just happen. There were many things we could do along the way to bring about different pathways. We did not take them. And the war is a result of our systems, our choices, and our approaches over those 30 years. We can speak much more about that after, but what I would also point out is that's the small theater. Because when you look at military confrontation and buildup, what's happening now in the South China Sea is much, much more significant and repeating the very patterns and dynamics that led to the conditions of war and the Russian invasion in Ukraine. The logic of perpetual confrontation and the ideological or security narrative, which is taught in security studies universities around the world, we are good, they are evil. We are right, they're wrong. Our intentions are good, our motivation is selfless. Theirs is bad, illegitimate. They want to do harm to others. When we have a deviation like the bombing of a wedding or the um, attack on a hospital, it was accidental, it was unintentional. When they do it, it is evil and sinister and shows how bad they truly are. Our actions are defensive, always in defense of greater common good, democracy, humanity, civilization, there's our offensive and an attack and a threat against all of us. The outcome, we want to win, they want to win, and the means that both accept is war. The challenge, I've told people often that one of the scariest spaces I've ever been in my life is the Black Sea Security Conference that was organized every year by Harvard, the Pentagon, the President's Office to look at addressing security challenges in the Black Sea. And here, people had enough gold on their epaulets to help relieve the debt in many different countries. You had the most senior level of political and military leadership and on a giant screen. So the wall was much bigger than this and the whole thing was a screen at the beautiful Marriott Hotel. They were presenting the threat from Russia. This is around 2014, 15, 16, 17. And they were looking at the buildup of military capabilities, the forward deployment of forces, the positioning of missiles, the use of cyber technologies to hack into systems and much more. The next part was where they said what we have to do to address this. And do you know what they called for? The forward deployment of forces, the buildup of missile and anti-missile systems, the use of cyber technologies to penetrate and impact within Russia. The very thing that one was doing, which was wrong, our solution was to do the same. The challenge is those conferences were also taking place in Moscow and Beijing. And everyone was stuck in and repeating. Remember from the Cold War, the acronym that was used for what will happen if we continue in this logic and this approach? Mutually assured destruction. Mad. Today, when it comes to effectively addressing many of the conflicts and situations we face, we often lack the right knowledge and understanding. We lack the appropriate doctrines or narratives and mental models to help us make sense of and see how to address it effectively. Organizations, movements, institutions, and capabilities able to do this. So what do you need if you want to have a war? You need people willing to fight. You need to mobilize, to engage, to organize them. But at the end of the day, you need units. They can be formal or informal. It can be an army. It can be non-state actors. You need the people willing to do it. Peace doesn't just happen. If we want peace to happen, we need to do it. We lack the alliances and strategic partnerships, the coherence and collaboration. Essentially, we lack the capabilities to address many or most of the critical crises and conflicts that face us effectively. I've been speaking too much, but do I have a little bit more? Okay. Apologies for speaking too much. I hope it's okay so far. We're living in a profoundly dangerous moment pregnant with risk, where the normalization and legitimization of war has grown, where confrontation rather than collaboration defines major state relations. 
and where we have escalating military budgets and limited competence of governments and states to handle conflicts effectively. Four premises. Possibilities for peace don't just exist. Possibilities for peace have to be created. So peace is made. I know you're going to hear about the Northern Ireland process later through this week. There's an incredible study, what's called the Cumulative Impact Assessment, where they look at what enabled change in Northern Ireland over three decades. What were the initiatives? Who did them? It is for anyone who is actually authentically interested in peace building, it's one of the fundamental types of resources we need to engage with to understand how do you go from where we are now to actually changing, transforming the dynamics. One of the things that they also said in this study is every single respondent believed that change happened because people willed it, designed it, did it, and persevered. Si vis pare pace, parum patrum. If you wish for peace, you need to prepare for peace. One of the oldest destructive concepts we have, part of our illiteracy of conflict and war and peace is the idea that if you wish for peace, prepare for war. If you prepare for war, you will get war. If we wish for peace, we need to prepare for peace, wage peace, do peace, and build the effective capabilities, the knowledge and understanding, the systems and institutions which enable us to address conflicts effectively. The other premise relevant for us today is the escalatory spiral of violence. The dynamics in the fog of war often lead to escalation in violence beyond parties' initial intentions. First, we weren't going to provide heavy artillery, then we've provided heavy artillery. We weren't going to provide surface-to-air missiles or anti-tank missiles, we provided anti-tank missiles. We weren't going to provide tanks, we've provided tanks. We weren't going to provide airplanes, we've provided airplanes. Everything we said was a red line, we've gone past it in the constant assumption that, well, Russia will accept it because we think it makes sense. One of the foundation premises of Clausewitz is on war is the understanding that the one you're in conflict with has their own ideas and their own will. And they're not just going to respond the way you expect them to. The absence of understanding of the other has been a fundament of the failure of war in many conflicts over the last decades. Four is peace building in the midst of war. When looking at what's happening in many situations of war in the world today, one of the things we often hear people say is, well, the moment isn't right. You know, it, this isn't the moment we can do something for peace building in Ukraine. But the point is, peace building in the midst of war is not based upon looking at the situation now and saying what's not possible. It's looking at where are we now, understanding the conflict, the dynamics, the engagement of different actors, who influences them, and looking at what can be done now to move from where we are to the situation and conditions in which peace can be possible. I should skip through some of this because I want to focus on the main solutions, but we'll share all of this with everyone. One is looking at the field of peace building as a field. The reality that over the last 70 years, peace building as a field has grown dramatically. We have more studies, more publications, more organizations involved, more universities that are engaging in it than we have ever had before. Unfortunately, that's a cumulative experience when you look at a grand level. But in practice, over the past 20 years, we've had a reassertion of fundamentalist militarism and failed culture strategies and approaches to dealing with conflict. And you can really look at a pivoting moment, collapse of the Soviet Union, but especially the first Gulf War and moving away from conflict intelligence and effective approaches. Most governments have profoundly limited grasp and understanding, let alone practical capacity for effective policies and measures to address conflicts and peace. And there's profoundly limited investment to build effective capacities or to actually support operational peace programs, peace building done on the ground to address critical conflicts. Also, unfortunately, most peace studies programs in the world, one thing we say as a peace institute that works directly on the ground is that we know that peace studies graduates are useless when they leave the university, except for very few programs, because they learn none of the functional competencies we need them to have 
to be of any use at all to the field. They know how to read what their professors have written. Their bibliographies are overwhelmingly written by men in the North that has diversified a little bit, but very little. And they don't get trained in how to actually do mediation in practice. They don't study and understand what are the major factors that lead to early warning systems not working and what can be done to make them better. They don't get trained in how to deal with the impact of trauma when you're working with people living in war or looking at the more than 70 cases we've had of reconciliation processes around the world and why do they work or not work and learning from it, not thinking I can cut and paste and do here what was done there, but learning how to understand the dynamics. So imagine you had university programs which graduated doctors and no one knew how to actually do medicine. So the expertise, the knowledge, experience has grown profoundly in the last 30 years, all around the world. But unfortunately, it's not widely or broadly held. We're not training people in enough of it. We haven't internalized this into our systems of governance and our economic systems. Last bits. When it comes to looking at a world at war, one of the areas that I would propose we need to focus on is the delegitimization of war as a policy instrument. War is functionally incompetent. It is not only about looking at how do we engage with the military, how do we work alongside the military. There are many in the military who understand this as well. One book by Sir General Rupert Smith, one of the most senior commanders of the British Armed Forces, longest serving commander in Northern Ireland, deputy commander of the first Gulf War. He wrote a book called The Utility of Force, where the fundamental argument is that force does not have utility in our world today. Force cannot create inclusive constitutions. The ability and the application of deadly force cannot overcome poverty and inequalities. We actually have real issues that we need real solutions to. Military is not a capable instrument for enabling those solutions. You can look at many cases and we can get into them in detail if you'd like, but Afghanistan, where you had one of the largest invasions in world history fighting one of the least provided for uh, armed forces and effectively defeating it, uh, being defeated by it. Iraq, the complete failure of the intervention in Iraq and the total betrayal of the people of Afghanistan and the people of Iraq by Canada by the United States, by Britain, by Germany, by Romania, by every country that took part in these wars, fueled the instability and death and violence that is happening, and then left because we found it easier. Mali, the French deploying a force, spending 1 billion euros a year. At the end of it, they are driven out. More civilians have been killed by the armed forces and the police than by insurgents and Islamic Jihad and they fueled the conditions which gave rise to it. Lebanon, Ukraine, we could go into many more. But this is a point, we're facing critical challenges and the instrument we're using to address them not only doesn't work, but it makes the problems worse. So you know, you know the idea of means testing that we use in architecture and medicine and many others? If we understand that war is a means, an instrument for addressing policy issues or political goals, then we can test it. How effective is it? Does it actually work? And more work needs to be done there. Languaging matters. The moment you have a conference, a class, a policy paper where you speak about hard and soft security, you've already defeated yourself. Because when you talk about hard and soft security, which one seems real? Which if you're in a crisis, are you gonna trust in? Okay, soft security is nice. If we have the luxury, we'll do that. But hard security, that's what we need. Or when we talk about alternatives, alternative security. Part of the discussion we should be having is about what is effective security and what is actual security and what works. And this shouldn't be a party uh, politics line. It should be something we engage with across all. Core concepts revisited. What I would like to point to is that the field of peace building is changing dramatically around the world. Just some ideas that we'll all be familiar with. Peacekeeping, okay? Canada, one of the countries that contributed. If you go to school in Canada, you learn that it was the country but a country that played a very significant role. But our definition of peace building, what we still teach in many university courses, we confuse form and function. 
So what we tell people peacekeeping is about is the deployment of international forces, external forces, United Nations, African Union, OSCE, and others, to come into an area where there's conflict and by their presence help to contribute to stability, security, and prevent the outbreak of violence. But in reality, peacekeeping does not have to be military. It can be civilian and unarmed. And often that's much more effective as nonviolent peace force, peace brigades international, and many others have shown. It does not need to be international. A lot of peacekeeping is done by good local police forces, if they are good and using right methodologies. A lot of peacekeeping is done by local community processes. It is the interpositioning, the presence, and the accompaniment to prevent violence. That is the actual function of peacekeeping. What's powerful here is when we recognize that the terms and concepts we've been using do not actually fit reality and are based in certain power structures. We can then become open to looking at reality and that there's so much more we can learn from around the world. Also, peacemaking. So the traditional definition, what many people think of when they hear the word peacemaking, is men in suits, high-level political, military leaders coming together to try and have negotiations and a solution, an outcome to the conflict. In reality, peacemaking is not just done by external actors or high-level political and military. You're having people engaging at every level in societies, using dialogue, mediation, local peace committees, and we could look at hundreds of case studies around the world where people within the context have driven forward initiatives and efforts to address the conflicts. And this is beginning to be reflected in peace studies programs, and it's beginning to be reflected in funding from external donors. But there's still a long way to go. And then peace building. Here, over the last 20 years, most of the functional field of conflict transformation, peace building has already advanced understanding, but you'll still often have courses which teach us that peace building is what happens after war, and there's an external intervention that comes in, the UN system, international NGOs, to help people recover after war. That's like talking about medicine as being what you do after you're dead. Yes, peace building should happen after war. Peace building should be taking place everywhere all the time including not only in other people's countries, but here at home. There's conflicts, there's violence within our own countries and communities. And if we want to prove how peace building works, it can also be important to develop it there. One fact, more women are killed by their husbands, family members, and people they know than in all the wars in the world put together. That is extreme violence. So peace building is about building the infrastructure and capacities to address conflicts effectively. It's about addressing healing from the visible and invisible impacts and effects of war on individuals and societies. It's about finding real solutions to the issues and the conflicts that we're experiencing. The last slides I have Martin Luther King Jr., those who love peace must learn to organize as effectively or more as those who love war. So one idea that I know many in Canada have been working with, infrastructure for peace. We need to build from local to national to global levels, the institutions, the capabilities, local peace committees, ministries and departments of peace. We need to look not only at having peace studies, but look at security studies, environmental studies, gender studies, political science, and other fields where we can engage in a dialogue with them and weave peace building into those fields as well. The same way that if we want to go to a doctor, I don't want the United Nations or a foreign charity to come with a health system. I want a good health system in my country and have access to it. If I want my children to go to school, I don't want to wait for a charity. I want to build up a healthy, effective education system in my country. Peace building is not the work of NGOs coming in from outside. Peace building should be a field that we develop the same as we have medicine, the same as we have education, the same as we have all others and where we build the multiplicity of competencies and systems that we need. Peace education in every level of our school systems. We carried out one of the largest ever studies looking at hate education to address hate, violent extremism, and radicalization. 
and we engage with experts and practitioners, educators, youth all over the world, including here in Canada. And some of the things we saw is that our education system today in many parts of the world has not fundamentally changed from when it first came forward when we had gas lighting and horse-drawn carriages. Our education today is not fit for the issues we face in the world today or for children and youth as human beings and their emotional and psychological needs. The question of emotions and psychology or psychology was raised earlier, and this is vital also at the level of well-being and human development of children and in our societies. So creating peace education, the same way that we all learn math or basic health, all learning effective ways of dealing with conflicts. Interestingly and concerningly today, we have polls and studies from around the world that show that children and youth are facing more anxiety, more depression, higher levels of self-harm, and the lowest levels of hope for the future. And we are not equipping them with the tools and capabilities to empower hope. Sorry, there's much more, but I've already spoken far too much, and my apologies for that. I put this picture up because one day, people will have to go into museums to know what a soldier was and what war was. That is vital, because if not, we will be destroyed by it. But if we want that day to happen, it matters what we do. We were given the three choices earlier. What was it? Suicide, alcoholism, or optimism. At one of the last talks ever that I gave in Ottawa in 2002, we were in a church in Centertown somewhere, and someone asked one of the speakers if they were an optimist or a pessimist. And the person said, I am not an optimist or a pessimist, but I have hope born from the choices I make and the action I take. Thank you. Okay. I know, it, was, it was lovely. Can you all hear me? Is the microphone working? No, that was, thank you. Yeah, it, everybody was captivated on top of that. I noticed that we do not have any questions in the Q&A, so I invite those online as well to um, add any questions they have in the Q&A. Um, also here, if anybody would like to step up to the mic and ask a question, there's also a roaming mic that we have also here at the table that we can use. But to start off with, I would just want to tie a few things, if you don't mind, Kai, and sort of start this off while people are uh, standing in front of the microphone. I, there's something that, you know, uh, you said that caught my attention, which was a war is something, um, it's in a system, it's a choice that we make. Um, and it's born of our own choices uh, that we make. And this, to me, is very interesting because a lot of what you discuss is about the choices. But sometimes... Um, our choices are extremely limited. Um, and sometimes we think they're limited because of what we're taught um, and how we're taught. I have four children who are going through the education system right now to our university, two are still going through it. And the options that they're given, the information that they're being provided with, that slide where you had, you know, we're good, they're bad, and so forth, that, that comparison that we often have, the way we start seeing things, do you notice this, this, uh, and we know as well, I mean, you know, a market doesn't float in the air. It's the choices that people make. It's the choices that decision makers make. It's the choices that those that are more powerful that make it. But do you, in your, um, I know you're hopeful um, and, and hopefully so am I at some points. I do go through cycles as well. But do you also feel like we have enough choices? to be able to make the alternative or the better choices. I think of, you know, some people in certain countries who there was a study that came out not too long ago about African-Americans joining the, the U S army, not because they love the army or they love their country, but they don't have, they have very little choice to do something else and be able to have insurance and healthcare and, you know, raise a family and so forth. So what is your take on the amount of options and choices that we have? What I would reflect is that at one level, what I'm speaking about is our choice as a species. Mm. 
our societies, our polities, and we have these choices that we are making and we have to. When you get down to the level of individuals, the space, the freedom, the empowerment and opportunity of choice is often dramatically limited. But part of what liberation movements, change movements, those working to go from where we are today to something different throughout history have done is help create the possibility, the understanding, the possibility of choice. We don't have to do it this way. We can do alternatives, but that isn't enough. Then you need to empower, engage, work to make those happen. So for example, the, the students in Nigeria, especially the female students that are standing up to systematic rape and sexual violence in the universities by professors, you would look at, they have a very impaired choice. Mm -hmm. If they raise their voices, they can be humiliated, attacked, turned on by family, by friends and others. But they are doing what many have done. One, they're recognizing the need. They're standing up with courage. They are organizing and coming together. And it is not changing things overnight, but it is part of the cumulative engagement for change, which without it, Change doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so it's it, from what I'm understanding, you see as well, it's that environment, maybe perhaps that we also need to work on to increase the choices that people have. And to earn the relationship and the right to even speak about these choices. Because sometimes, for example, um, I was at an event with an amazing initiative working on peace building in the United States years ago, just a short while after September 11th. They were incredibly well-meaning people and people that were passionate and wanted to engage. They were all middle class and upper. They were exclusively white, and they all came from some social cultural backgrounds. And they were looking at what the US was doing globally. But a lot of citizens in the United States are struggling daily with the violence of the economic system, with violence from police, with um, many different issues. And at one point, if we really want to work on peace building, it is important for us to engage and understand what is affecting people in our societies and what are the issues they're dealing with. And it's why, as I mentioned last, no last night, Yash Tanden uh, once stood up in front of a huge audience of people in Norway and he said, we don't want your solidarity. We don't want you caring about what's happening in our countries. We don't want you demonstrating it uh, about it. We want you to grow up and start taking responsibility for what your country is doing. Norway has a reputation for working in peace building and supporting peace processes, and it does. But it's also one of the largest weapons producers in the world per capita. It also has played very active roles in the 90s in expanding neoliberal structural adjustments. And I would, I would offer a different narrative and languaging matter. It is not that after the collapse of the Soviet Union, the market played a more significant role. Markets exist in every type of economic system. It's after the collapse of the Soviet Union, which was an abhorrent, brutal, violent regime and system. And anyone who doesn't grasp that, you have not been there. And we have romantic and naive comprehension of it. Um, or you haven't been there extensively. But after its collapse, we had nothing as a counterforce in terms of expansive global authoritarianism through the power of corporations and capital. Which leads to, I don't, if anybody here would like to ask a question, please step up to the microphone, but I just want to tie it to one question that was online. Um, and it's interesting because it, 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 you know, we talk about choice and one of the things that a lot of us here know is that even in democracies, choices are limited for certain groups of people, depending on the situation, because of those systemic issues that we were talking, you were, you were making references to, but there is this question to ask, um, how realistic can peace building occur in environments lacking democracy? In most contexts in where peace building occurs, it is environments that are lacking democracy. So it's not how can it occur in those environments. Those are the environments where it does take place. Peace building is very often taking place where you're having not the, you know, political system of people coming together across differences, but people using guns to confront each other over those differences. And peace building does something that we need to make fundamental in our democracy. This is another very interesting reality. For democracy to function, we need to embed peace building in it. 
Because for democracy to function, I would suggest healthily, we need to have the recognition that your rights matter as do mine. That what is important for you is also important, not only what's important for me. And we need to evolve democracy to have more collaborative democracy, to come together across differences to work to address issues. So there we need to look at how do we build peace building and the basic tools and understandings of peace building into our democratic system. But in areas in which there's the absence of you know, political stability and democratic stability, it's the core that anyone working deeply in peace building understands. One, you need to earn trust and relationship with the parties involved. And that might not be you, but actors that they do trust. You need to have the entry points to connect with people. Two, you need to be able to identify and address what are the legitimate issues which are critical to them. That's not always the narratives, that's not always the positions, but it's really understanding. Three, you need space for dealing with pain and anger and hurt. And you need to know how what the words you use, how they're actually heard. Like I can just share with you now when well-meaning people in North America and Western Europe say, we need to stop the war in Ukraine. We need to have peace in Ukraine. What people in Ukraine hear is you're a puppet of Putin. You're, you're championing Putin. You're celebrating Russia's annexation of a large part of the country. And you're legitimizing rape, war crimes, crimes against humanity, and usually the people who are saying that we need that peace are coming from a very good place, well-intentioned place. They see the destruction. They see the war happening. But very few of them have ever taken a moment to actually hear the grief and the pain that people in Ukraine are living with. So without recognizing or listening or hearing, they're coming with a solution. But again, what we mean by peace matters. So if you say peace where it means we accept the invasion, we accept annexation, we accept the displacement of over 8 million people, the abduction of hundreds of thousands of children, all of this. If you were to say we want peace in which all invading forces have to withdraw because we don't accept that any country has the right to invade another country and to, to command by dictat. If you call for peace where you call for accountability, for war crimes, for leaving bodies to rot in the street, for using um, the breadth of weapons that have been involved. If you call for peace, which addresses what gave rise to the war, then you can maybe have a starting point for a discussion. If before talking, you also first listen and try to understand. Thank you. Sorry. You can just identify yourself too. No, you need to turn it on at the top. Hello, hi. My name is Kiran Nazish. Glad to be here. Thank you, Kai. That was a great presentation. I liked that you started and used the word species a lot, something that we don't really think, and I think that's one of the issues that I find in my research as well. Um, and also thank you for, you know, mentioning journalists and, you know, women. Daphne Caruana Galizia was, was a friend of mine, um, and we've been working a lot with, like, almost all the journalists you had here. Um, I, I do want to ask, and this is kind of interesting because I'm here for, particularly for that purpose, um, is when you talk about peace, like I like everything about your presentation where you mentioned that we need peace builders and all that have to be integrated in democracy, all of that. But when you calculate in our society, how many, the proportion of people who are peace builders different kinds of peace builders, not just those who are on the ground, but activists, academics, people who are researching, thinking, doing active peace building. Proportionally, where are they? <laughs> and how many are there, right? Um, I mean, I can, I can just say that I've, I've been a journalist for 20 years and you know, worked in 12 conflicts. And where I see any peace builders, that category I see is either behind bars or they are dead because they've been killed, or they're in exile, which is, which is why I'm here speaking to government officials to find protection mechanisms for exile journalists um, in Canada. Um, but my question to you for that would be, you are here doing this work of peace building. When you are sitting in rooms and you look at humanity as a species, what do you see? Uh, what are the things that you think are missing? And how many of you are present in the room? Thank you. Fortunately, it's not how many of me's, 
It's that there are people of so many different backgrounds, experiences, cultures, colors, everything that are involved. And when you're asking where are they, the majority of those actually directly engaging in peace building are very often within their own communities and countries. So you have the whole system and architecture of professional NGOs and people that go into other countries, often with programs and projects that have the word peace building, reconciliation, prevention in it, often well-meaning, some great, huge global organizations. I work directly with them. And one of the real challenges we're facing is that in most of them, almost no one has actually been trained in how to do it. Peace building isn't the same as writing as a journalist, being an activist, talking about politics. Peace building is when you add in actual skills and tools for dealing with conflicts. And we need to learn and train and build those skills and tools. There are more and more involved, but one of our challenges are there are very few spaces to help people build those capacities and to help to learn. And peace building as a, as a field is as broad as the field of medicine. So you could have people that work on holding space for difficult conversations. You can have people that work in civilian peacekeeping. You can have people that work in dialogue and mediation. You can have people that work in schools and peace education. And what's interesting is you do see throughout our societies, you can have families where one of the children or one of the people is the peacemaker in the family. They try to listen to everyone. They try to get people to calm down a bit. They try and get people to, to, to get along. We build tools and systems. So in some cultures, you have gurus. So when I'm facing an individual crisis or challenge in my life, there's someone I look to that helps me. In Romania, they have this brilliant system of godparents to weddings so that when you get married, you choose as a couple, your godparents. It's another married couple that are your friends that have been married longer than you. So that when you face a challenge, you're not hearing from your mother-in-law, your father-in-law, or your family members around you. You can go to people who love you both and have had experience themselves. And that is a peace-building mechanism at that level. We have lots. We need to unearth these and to understand at the same time, we are living in a different moment for our species. And the same way that we are evolving new solutions across many fields, we need to evolve the field of peace building. We need to learn what's being done in neuroscience. We need to learn what's being done in behavioral sciences. And then some of these areas have been in the field since the 70s, but there's so many new innovations. I didn't speak to it much, but on the, the slide I showed about peace education and the study I mentioned, we looked at what's being done in anti-bullying education around the world. We looked at what's being done on girls' rights and gender education. We looked at what's being done on anti-racism education, what's being done on a field that very few know about, which is an incredibly interesting one, solutions education. We looked at what we discovered were 18 different fields of work being done to address real issues and to innovate in the field of education. But what was interesting is that almost none of them are talking to each other. And many of them don't even know about each other. So I know the work I'm doing here deeply, but I don't know what you're doing over there. And this is one of the other innovations in human engagement over the last 30 years, design-based approaches, where you don't say that's the person, that's the expert. This has been one of the most devastating components of peace building. And it's funny for me to say this at a university, but because a lot of the early work was being done by pioneers who were academics in universities, you thought that you had to have the American professor fly into Cyprus. You had to have someone who is an academic come in. And a lot of those people had human competencies and skills and wisdom and knowledge which helped them. But simply coming from an academic institution doesn't mean you have the, the knowledge and skills and tools for how to do peace building. And where those peace builders are, we need to build them up in different spaces. And the same way as it's a different set of tools for someone doing first aid and emergency response, to someone doing neurosurgery, to someone that researches on diseases, we need to build up all these roles. That requires organization, that requires investment, but it also requires, like CERN, imagination and being able to see that it's possible. I've worked almost 30 years in the field I have come across a handful of publications that look at what are the different roles in peace building and the competencies needed for them. Even people working in the field for decades, it hasn't been that developed. Um, before we get to the floor, sorry, one question came in a bit 
uh, earlier as well um, from Leslie McQueenie. I'm, I, there's a bit of a setup, but in, in general, talking about greed um, and the pursuit of power and control um, and talking about that nothing really, in essence, no race, no face, no political tribal or religious, religious organization in history has ever shown to be exempt from this. Uh, so the question is, what do you suggest your average human being do in order to deconstruct the greed and pursuit of power that have created the master's houses? What I would suggest, just my reflection is, as people, yes, we can be greedy. We can also be kind. I have seen things more horrific than any human being should ever experience, as I know people in this room have as well and lived with. And you can also see things that are done with such extraordinary beauty that it seems as grace. And most of what we do is this big mess in between when it comes to people. But this is where institutions and systems matter. It's, I mean, you can go back to the work of the Frankfurt School, for example, looking at the culture that comes out of capitalism and normalizes it. Or you can speak to people involved in refuseniks in Israel where they speak about you can come into a war system and you can be someone that cares about other people that would never want to use violence. But when you're in that system, it makes you do horrible things. And yes, there can be choice. But one of the reasons I work in peace building is a question asked by my grade seven history professor in Ottawa, where he was asking, how could the Germans let it happen? And I was so disgusted by his question because we're letting those things happen also on many levels. You have 42 to 40 million people dying every single year from a lack of access to medicines and clean water. We're making the choice to let that happen and do nothing about it. It's not how did they make that choice and not us. It's recognizing that I'm not naive enough. I'm someone who comes from a background where I had family in concentration camps. But I'm not naive enough to think that if I grew up in Germany through the cholera epidemic after the war, through the poverty, through the famine, through all that context, that I would do something different. I'd like to naively think I would, but that's stupidity and arrogance. So it depends what we expose people to, how we help them make choices, and what we foster in our systems. If we integrate restorative justice into school systems and we empower and teach people how to respect others and how to deal with conflicts healthily, then when I am faced with conflict, I have empowered choice. But if instead what I hear is if that person does something I don't like, it's because they're stupid or they're evil or they're wrong. And what I should do is break the relationship or yell at them or we learn that. So currently we're in an economic system which is extraordinarily productive on some levels, incredibly incompetent and inefficient because there's so much waste at many other levels, but it also generates frameworks of choice. And what we need to do is to look at that and see how we can enable and build alternatives. There's a question, I think Manfred, to you hand up at one point and then we'll get to the gentleman in the back. Hi, thank you for a, for a very stimulating presentation. Um, I'm struggling a little bit getting my head around what peace building is. You, you've told us that peace building, st peace studies have proliferated uh, and we've made great advances. You, you said that uh, there are lots of institutions uh, training people in peace building, but then you also told us that the graduates they produce and you, you expressed yourself rather forcefully, uh, have virtually none of the skills that they actually need. So I'm having trouble putting those two pictures together. Uh, sorry. Uh, and it seems to me that in order to really get to grips with the things you're advocating, many of which are on the face of them reasonable and desirable, uh, I think it might be, for me at least, it would be necessary to get a bit better picture of the structures within which people have to confront these challenges. And that takes us into, well, all those big areas like political economy. And it reminds us that uh, an example I used to uh, use uh, a lot with my students, many of the fathers of 
the American Constitution said that this experiment with uh, Republican government uh, on which we are embarking could never work unless certain preconditions were met. Uh, and the two preconditions they always highlighted were A, income inequality must remain moderate, and two, the people seeking office and the people voting for them must both place a high value on public virtue, which is a rather convoluted way of saying they have to have some commitment to the public welfare as members, citizens of this country. Uh, and unless we, we define some context like that, then I think, for me at least, it becomes very difficult to, to try to, to engage with the question of what kinds of behaviors might or might not produce conflict. When you say that certain people confront certain issues and they make progress uh, in reducing certain kinds of violence, well, that's what Isolt says. That's exactly their approach to uh, taking charge of a problem. And the next thing you know, and, and your example on, on Ukraine, I'm afraid uh, you're very harsh on those who believe the war was not necessary, but there, to, to start with the destruction and the agony of the people who are now going through that destruction and to say, well, that's the determining characteristic, no. There never needed to be a war. The only thing that was needed was an agreement on Ukrainian neutrality. The, the current president ran on a platform of seeking reconciliation with Russia. Uh, so all that agony, which you're talking about, could have been avoided. And so then we have to ask ourselves, why was that not possible to agree on something which would have avoided all that destruction? So. I, I really appreciate the picture you drew, but for me, um, we need more structure in thinking about what kinds of societies, why is it that certain Scandinavian countries keep appearing in the top 10 of every, uh, of the, the best performance on every social pathology you can think of? Well, I think it's because they created certain structures that make it possible for people to deal peacefully with each other. I would agree fundamentally. And that's part of the whole point. On some of the things you said, why do I speak forcefully about when we have programs and we graduate people from it, but we have not designed our programs for them to learn actual competence and skills and tools is because people are dying as a result. So we have still a field in which a lot of the organizations that are involved are coming from North America, are coming to Western Europe, from Western Europe. And for example, in one area where we were called in to support one of the largest peace building organizations in the field, they had 5 million euros, sorry, sorry, 5 million US dollars for working to support a program on early warning and prevention in Northeast Nigeria, where Boko Haram is where the military has massive Western assistance and is carrying out operations against Boko Haram, often affecting civilian populations. Now, this organization is one of the most famous organizations in the world in our field, in peace building. They had a $5 million project for two years, which is a fairly large sum for organizations working in this field. It's crumbs globally, but... They did not have one person in their staff, in their project team, who had any experience at all on developing an early warning system. They had never done it before. The person who wrote the project was sitting in Brussels, not on the ground in Northeast Nigeria. That project could have been done in a way that it could have significantly contributed to addressing issues which were about people dying. But because we graduate people without going into learning the actual skills you need, there is amazing waste and incompetence in our field. My youngest son had a situation in which he had a few hours to live if he wasn't on an operating table. Within two hours, he would have died. 
In the city I live in, the children's hospital is across the park from my house. When we realized what was happening, we brought him there. And he was in surgery for the next hours. But that was possible because we have a university that trained that surgeon in the skills they need to know to address those issues. That was possible because we live in a country where we invest in and have children's hospitals. We had the infrastructure for it. So when we're talking, saying, you know, what do we mean by peace building? We could go a lot deeper there and we could map out what it is, but it's about having mediation capabilities. It's about having early warning systems where you can understand the factors that give rise to conflict and the underlying drivers. It's about having conflict sensitive budgeting and policy making so that when you have a local or national government create a budget or create policies, you look at what is the impact it can have on conflict relations and dynamic. And we now have the metrics and the tools for all of that. And when you're asking about countries like in the Nordic countries, many of you may well be familiar with the Global Peace Index and where it looks at what are the actual factors which in a society can increase the peaceableness and the peacefulness within that society. And that is one of the areas where we need to work. And what's very interesting is most of that is dealing with social, economic, political policies, not just the work of what peace building NGOs often engage with. And that is where we need to bring those conversations further as Paul was saying before as well. I want to clarify what I may have misexpressed or been misheard. I was saying the exact opposite of the war was necessary. I was saying the war was a result, and, and I would express it, of continual military expansionism and confrontation driven by policies from both NATO and Russia. There's a problem where some people look at this because you don't like, you know, U.S. and Vietnam, U.S. and Iraq and everything. We say, oh, the U.S. is the evil empire. Well, excuse me, but the regime in Moscow is absolutely brutal as well. If you don't know Grozny, if you don't know the targeted assassination and killing of uh, LGBTQI community, of journalists, of many others, this is not a nice regime. It's possible that two things can be bad at the same time. And they were both pursuing these policies, which did not need to be. And I agree. That was an entirely preventable war, as most have been. The point I was trying to make is that that war happened because of the systems, the strategies, and the approaches we were putting in place over the last 30 years to address dynamics in Europe. I would say they say that that war also happened because of the U.S. invasion of Iraq, the U.S. engagement in Afghanistan, the wars in Yemen, the invasion in Libya, because we've given rise to a context in which, as the IRC was saying, we've removed the guardrails. The idea that we need to respect international law, that we're not supposed to use military force to intervene in another country. And I can't do something I want to do over and over and over again and then become upset with you when you do the same. We've created a context, especially after September 11th, 2001, where we've been legitimizing violent repression and military intervention. Another part that I didn't look to, but which is critical, is the rise of mercenary corporations over the last 30 years. This was something that we had almost banished. In, in the 70s and 80s, there was very limited use of mercenary corporations. Today, it's a multi-billion dollar industry globally, and they're involved in training of police. They're involved in running prisons. They're involved in deployment and operations. And we all hear now about Wagner, but Wagner is the ninth largest of them. There are many others that are operating the same way. So um, the, the thing when you mention ISIL, which I think is important, they don't say the same thing I do. They say that there is a problem and they engage people to address it. And what I think is important when you try to understand what we often call violent extremist movements, why do people join um, white supremacist movements? Why do they join the Proud Boys? Why do they join ISIS? There's a whole range of reasons. And I, I was on the ground in Iraq at the height of ISIS throughout, right in Nineveh, which is where they predominantly were. Some people joined because once they took Mosul, the government and others were saying, you know, you're either with us or against us. But they were on the ground in Mosul and ISIS was saying you're with us or against us. And they were left no other option. Some people joined because they needed to get access to medical care for their loved one or family member. The only way they could do that is if they joined ISIS. Some people joined for a whole range of reasons. But one thing about ISIS was it provided choice. 
It gave people a way they could look at something they don't agree with, and it gave them a narrative to not agree with it. And then it gave them a way they could act and do something. And it's important to realize that if we want to bring about change, we need to help people find ways that they can engage on the issues which are wrong, which they don't agree with, but to do that in ways that lead to healthy solutions. To do that where I'm not killing you, but we're finding a better way forward together. Can I, sorry, I would have to interrupt. Maybe those in the room, we can, you can speak to Kai during the break just because we're, we're running out of time. I'm so sorry. I'm sorry it's uh, my fault because the answers are too long the, the, the perspectives. <laughs> um, Evelyn did make a good point in the chat saying that, Kai, you're going to be part of the Peace Professionalism panel as well. So a lot, some of this information will come back. Um, and this will be discussed some more. There are really interesting points, again, that maybe we can also come back to related to, you know, when civilians are suffering, the example was Sudan that was provided in the chat as well. Um, you know, what would we do? How, we do, how do we do this? Um, you know, talking about uh, divide and conquer policies and whatnot. But I think, you know, as we sort of chew on this a little bit, if I could also leave with a little bit of a note here in a sense where uh, we've used a lot, a lot of these examples, but I think what is also underpinning all of this, the Norwegian countries use, use them as peaceful uh, countries, but when you speak to Syrian refugees who live in these places, they're not necessarily that peaceful towards them either. So, you know, the, the fact of choice, the fact of being able to decide to do something um, often is very much restricted uh, by the living conditions and the circumstances that, that, that uh, surround us. Um, and so the part of the systemic change I really appreciated is looking at what makes these options limited um, and looking at why we end up assuming that that's the solution and that's where we have to go. So I'd like to thank you. Sorry, we have to wrap up. So those in the room, please um, have a conversation with Kai during the break. Those online, we'll try to kind of figure out how to, how to answer some of the questions that you have it, um, dropped in there. Um, I will turn it back to Gord, though. I think if I'm not mistaken, if Gord is still there um, for another peace song while we set up in the back for some more coffee. There's also still food, so please um, serve yourselves as well in some snacks. Could I just mention in closing, and yes. it's wonderful in terms of the next session that's coming, because this is a field where there is massive and growing evidence. And very often when you can make it tangible and you can help people see what can be done and how we can address the situation, people do engage. The core that I hope comes out of what I was presenting is, yes, there are a lot of challenges and they are systemic and significant, but we also are innovating incredible engagements and solutions. And peace building is a field that is real. We can learn, we can train, we can study, and we can have better ways of addressing conflicts. Thank you. Gord, are you still there? Yes, yes, I am here. And uh, thank you very much, Kai and Ruby. Uh, yes, we have uh, been uh, playing a song. We played a song this morning. We're playing a song after this presentation. Thank you, Kai. The one that uh, we've chosen here is uh, reflecting on our hopes and dreams for a, a better wor world. Uh, we're all familiar with the song. Last night, I had the strangest dream. It was, for those who uh, are curious, it was written in 1950 by Ed McMurdy, an American folk singer. It's been sung by so many people, but uh, right now it's uh, going to be sung by a band called The Grateful We're Not Dead. And the lead singer is uh, Don White. Uh, the band plays for charities and, uh, and uh, seniors' homes. So here is the uh, song. When I was a young man, I carried my pack, and I lived the free life. I'm not sure what happened, but uh, that's not the song we were going to be playing. Uh, here it is now. Last night I had the strangest dream I ever dreamed before. Never 
Lord.